Morning, everybody. I'm really conscious that we have a short amount of time, and I have a lot of slides. And I'm Irish, so I can talk a lot as well. So um, I've got a few warnings, I hope, about kind of time and a few signals for me. Um, it's an absolute privilege to be with you um, here today to talk about what the Stroke Foundation sees as the future of stroke in Australia, and we don't see it in isolation. This is an absolute partnership, and I think we've seen that quite a lot, those messages um, from this morning about why we need to be investing in this space, but also why it really does take a whole system to save a life. So I'm going to give you some really high-level stats. I know you've had a lot of graphs and stats already today, but I'll try and whip through them quite quickly, just to give you a picture of what it's like in Australia. And then my colleague Andy is actually going to give you a picture of what it's like in New Zealand. And we do actually in Australia work closely with the um, Stroke Association in New Zealand and try and share our experiences as well. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're gathered here this morning and pay my personal respects to elders past, present and emerging from the Noongar people. Um, it's really important and in fact actually a lot of the stuff that we will talk to about the future of stroke is actually around getting to those rural and remote indigenous communities and making sure that they have the best chance of having a good outcome from stroke as we do with every Australian that lives no matter where they are, in a city, in a rural area or in a remote area. So let's just look at the scale of the problem. This is what we estimate will be in Australia at the moment. In this year, 2019, 56,000 strokes. And in fact, actually, that may not be correct because we do know that a lot of strokes actually never get reported. What we are seeing now is a reclassification of trans ischemic attacks and they're going to be described as mini strokes. So we could actually see this number um, jump up as we actually get better at that data collection. But it's a pretty scary number now. What does it equate to in terms of the length of time I'm going to talk? Well, we have a stroke every nine minutes in Australia. And based on what you saw this morning from Bernard's um, slides around the population growth, we have a growing and aging population in this country. That number is actually going to go up to one every four minutes if we do nothing to change the paradigm in which we live at the moment. So that is doing better in prevention, doing better in early detection, doing better in faster care. And we are living in a generation where in the last 20 years we have seen extraordinary advances in the way acute stroke is treated. But it's not consistent. So it does depend on where you live, it does depend on your access to healthcare, and it does depend on what part of the country you're in as well. So, you know, we live in a wonderful federation in this country, but it does mean our health services are all set up a bit differently. And the standards of care and the approaches and where the investment has been made over the years has been different. So you're not going to get the same kind of care, but we do want to change that. So the Stroke Foundation has been doing um, audits of the hospital system for almost 20 years. And in that time, we can demonstrate the huge advances that have happened in the medical, um, in the acute side particularly. Disappointingly, those have not been mirrored in the rehabilitation side. And what's most interesting is that if you look at the data over the last 20 years, what we have done in prevention has meant the mortality from stroke, with some small exceptions, but the mortality from stroke has actually hugely declined. So much more people, many more people are actually surviving a stroke than they ever did before. What that has meant is more people are living with stroke and what we haven't seen is the same sort of advances in recovery and rehabilitation. So we have a huge population now that are now living with stroke, over 475,000 people in Australia living with stroke and we're not doing enough to understand how recovery really works and what is the magic sort of silver bullet in recovery that will really enable us to make sure that somebody gets the best chance of living a full and active life post a stroke. So the whole system also needs to kind of, you know, reorientate itself around this whole recovery um, action plan that needs to happen in the stroke field. We do know that globally, actually according to the World Stroke Organization, stroke is now killing one in four, affecting one in four people. And in some countries, it's the top killer. So this is a huge problem. Don't underestimate it across the globe. And the number of strokes that are happening in younger people, so under 70, I was kind of glad to know that actually I'd gone from being an old person in 1939 to being an adult, according to Bernard Salt's data. I was like kind of freaked out, thinking, oh my God, I'm an old person. But this is telling you that under 70, 58% of strokes happen. Now, most of us know that under 70, we're all pretty active still, and we're still having really active and engaged lives. 58% of strokes are happening under 70. 
So what's happening in acute treatments? Well, some of the great news stories. So thrombolysis, which has one been, been one of the game-changing drugs in stroke, has actually, the availability has really improved over the last 20 years. So in 1999, we had 4% of hospitals that had this drug available. It's up to 77% in 2017. The problem is that people don't often get it, and that is down to how the whole system works. So although 70, 70 percent of hospitals actually have this drug available, only 11 percent of our patients across the country are actually getting access to that in a timely fashion. Now some of that is time related, but it's also how the system is set up. We do know that the proportion of patients who get into a stroke unit is actually increasing as well. This gives patients the best chance of making the best recovery from stroke. This is the golden sort of treatment, is to get people into a stroke unit so they can be treated by a multidisciplinary team. We also know that front end of the hospital needs to be improved. Compared to some of our international colleagues, Australia is actually lagging behind on this. And this is where the people in this room have a huge impact on this. This is about initiating poster triage in the ambulance to tell the hospital that you're on your way with a stroke so that the person is there to greet you at the door and everything works like clockwork. And again, where well, you've got good stroke, code stroke systems in place across the country, this is working like clockwork. The best in the country are able to treat stroke that arrives in a hospital within 24 minutes. That's what they're aiming to do. The faster we can treat stroke, the more brain we can save and the better chance of a full recovery. We also know in the rehabilitation space that even where we are focused on rehabilitation, we're focusing on getting the person mobile, getting them safely home from a physical perspective. We're doing very little around their cognitive impairment issues, the challenges they have with fatigue, with depression. And that means if I'm depressed and I'm really exhausted, how well do you think I'm going to engage with my rehabilitation? Not very well. So it, we really need to, again, switch the system over and saying, looking at a person's uh, cognitive um, impairment, looking at their, their risk of depression is as important as actually focusing on their physical rehabilitation. If they're going to have the best chance of getting back into the workforce, of actually being socially included again and having a full and active family life. We also know that people aren't routinely using guidelines. Now, what are they using if they're not routinely using guidelines? Is it because they don't know where they are? Is it because they don't believe that the guidelines are up to date? We in the Stroke Foundation are currently working on developing a living guideline model. So we're going to take that, you know, that reason out of the mix completely. So it means that the information that's available on the Stroke Guidelines is the latest. It's based on evidence-based research and you can trust it. Now, what if we did better? So we analyzed the data over 10 years and we said if people got the best care, between 2007 and 2017, we would have avoided the loss of 17,000 healthy life years. This isn't just a moral imperative. This is actually a health economics imperative. These are people that could be productive in the workforce, productive in our communities. This is a huge challenge for us. We must take it seriously. So we are. We've got some small amount of funding from the federal government and together with the Heart Foundation we've actually developed a national action plan for stroke. And that sits around those four key pillars of prevention and early detection, diagnosis and treatment, this is where these people in the room come into play, support and care and research. The government has also, under that research um, banner, already invested through the Medical Research Future Fund $220 million in the cardiovascular space. And this is really because there's a lot of people out there who think we've become a bit complacent. So we've got our statins and we've got, you know, we're trying to manage high blood pressure, but we've really become a bit complacent about what we need to do to really switch the paradigm. We still have 20% of strokes that we have no they're, they don't fit into any of the obvious risk factors. Can you imagine being a working age person who's had a stroke diagnosis and we can't tell you why? How frightening would that be to think, when is my next stroke going to happen? How frightening would it be for a member of your family thinking, can I leave this person alone for any length of time because I'm terrified they're going to have another stroke? Then we must do more to understand the pathology of stroke. We also need to do the same in the cardiac space. We also need to actually shorten that time frame between basic research and translation into real practice. On average, it's 20 years from drug discovery to implementation. That's way too long. If we were in aviation, they'd be doing it in a heartbeat, turning things around, developing technology, testing it, and getting it out there. We need to get much more efficient at this. 
We've seen the chain of survival. This is a great um, slide that I borrowed off David from a presentation he gave to some of our um, telemedicine clinicians, and this is adapted for us. Where the Stroke Foundation comes in is that first part particularly, is making sure that the community through public education and through awareness campaigns understands the FAST message. When we see this working, we see the start of a system that can be optimized to save a life, and it does take a whole system to save a life. I think this is really, I love the concept of having the bigger the bigger parts at the front end, because we can get everything right at the back end, but if somebody doesn't pick up the phone and make that emergency call, the whole thing is for nothing. One of the things that we do have in a federation is many different models. So we have pre-hospital assessment tools, all different tools right the way across the country. Now one of the challenges that we have with this is that our treatment for large vessel occlusion type stroke has radically changed in the last few years. We now have clot retrieval, which is an absolute game changer in stroke. What we need to do is make sure that we can identify those strokes as early in the system as possible. Because there is no point in bringing a, a patient with a large vessel occlusion into a hospital where on average, once you bring the, the person into hospital and you get them into the ED and they have a scan and they're seen and they're triaged and all of that, and then you identify a large vessel stroke, on average, that's about two hours before they can then be transferred onto a bigger hospital. That's two hours where their brain is dying in front of you. So what can we do to actually avoid them going into these smaller hospitals? We have seen in the Stroke Foundation so many tragic cases where people have you know, huge and lifelong disability because they went into a primary hospital, sometimes without even access to a CT scanner out of hours or over a weekend. We must do better to do that large vessel occlusion uh, identification at the front end. Um, we have an act fast al algorithm that's been tested in Melbourne. We have one that was presented at the European Stroke Conference this year, and I know that we've got a panel discussion on this very topic, so I'm not going to go into it in any detail. But this is about saying, if we can identify that large vessel, we can bypass those hospitals that can't give that kind of clot retrieval treatment and get somebody to a comprehensive stroke center. In Australia, this is critical. I myself are going to Townsville later in the year, in about six weeks. And I've already like, texted a couple of neurologists in Brisbane and said, you know, can I have you on speed dial? Because I know in Townsville we don't have a clot retrieval service. That frightens the life out of me. We have a big population in the north of Queensland, and all of our clot retrieval services are down the east coast in Brisbane and on the Gold Coast. You know, in this day and age, that's not good enough. We have a dispersed population, but that should generate the innovation that we need to really change the system. We have it. We have technology now that can actually provide specialist stroke services via video into all of our regional hospitals. We have a fully operationalized telestroke um, network in, in Victoria. We're about to get one up and running in Tasmania. We've got pilots going across the country. This is a potential game changer. Yesterday, I was part of really a hugely exciting announcement, which is about taking this concept of providing emergency stroke services out to our regional and rural areas to the next level. So we already have a mobile stroke unit, and that has been a sensation to be involved in, not just because it's got the message out to our, to our community that stroke is a medical emergency, but because it's actually bringing the emergency department to a patient's driveway. And I know that Sky Coot has actually got a whole session on this, so really go to her session. It's fantastic to actually get the data from this and see the impact that it's having on our stroke care. The key thing with this is to actually miniaturize all of that. So you saw a bit about that this morning, about how we can miniaturize some of the CT works with these helmets that do microwave um, sort of technology to exclude a um, hemorrhagic stroke. And that's critical to being able to deliver that first line clot dissolving drugs. So it's really important that we you know, invest in this innovation. We have a country where we've had trailblazers for years because we have a massive geographical space, and we have a population that's dotted all over. That kind of challenge breeds innovation. So we are going to be the first country to put a CT scanner in the air. We are going to be the first country that will roll out a national stroke-capable ambulance fleet. I have no doubt. And the team that's about to like, pull all of this together has got 12 months to prove that case to the government, and hopefully get a big grant to develop the technology. So watch this space. 
We also are driving the latest in research. So we're extending the treatment windows for clot dissolving drugs. They're now going up from four and a half hours up to a potential nine hours with advanced imaging. And we've extended the clot retrieval to 24 hours, again, based on advanced imaging. On the other side, there are some fantastic trials looking at stem cells and whether stem cells can actually repair damaged brain cells through strokes. That's actually happening out of Monash University. There's also this neuroprotective drug, Calgary in Canada, collaborating with Melbourne and Adelaide to actually develop these neuroprotective drugs. Recovery and rehabilitation, we need to do more on this. And now I'm just going to be out of time, so I'm going to go through this really quickly. The key thing is here, we need to understand more about the mechanisms that are associated with recovery. We see one patient with a type of stroke who makes a fantastic recovery next to the, another patient which looks exactly the same with a similar type of stroke and have a completely different recovery pathway. We need to understand more about why that difference takes place and what we can do to intervene more. Wouldn't it be great to know that your type of stroke because of your biomarkers will respond better to an exercise program and this person will respond better to an anti-inflammatory sort of drug supported by better diet. Wouldn't that be fantastic that we could actually customize rehabilitation to give you the best outcome? I am, I am going to finish now and say the whole system relies on us all being stroke aware. So that means making sure that every time you get an opportunity to be in front of a different audience that you teach them the fast message. Our stroke campaign for this stroke week this year is all about fast heroes. You're all a bunch of fast heroes because you know the signs of stroke and you talk to your families about it all the time. Please tell anybody who hasn't heard about this, the fast message. The more people that know, if every household in Australia and every workplace had somebody that knows the signs of stroke, we can actually have a system that will save lives. Thank you.